Hi everyone. People often ask how they can support more great stories from The Wild, and we really appreciate you asking. Thank you. Uh, the Wild is a joint production of myself and KUOW Public Radio, and you can support this vital work and become part of The Wild community by checking out our show notes. There you'll find information about supporting my wildlife organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, through Patreon. Help fuel the next adventure. Okay, enjoy the episode, guys. Reminder, mask every part of the whole on the boat. Right, we're just getting onto the and boat here, aboard, down at the okay. harbour in Ventura. Good morning. Good morning. The boat I'm boarding is going to take me out to Santa Cruz Island, about 30 miles west of Ventura, California. Thank you. Santa Cruz Island is one of five islands in Channel Islands National Park, and for an ecologist like me, it's a bit of a dream. Islands are special in ecology. They can provide a totally unique environment to study communities of wildlife and how different species interact. And the island I'm heading to is home to a quite famous fox. It's like no apex predator I've ever seen before. These aren't the type of foxes you might see on the mainland. These island foxes are small, very small. They're ferocious four pound carnivores that are, have no fear. Um, they're curious, they're mischievous to the point of being annoying sometimes. <laughs> These foxes almost look like they were, you know, designed by people to be cute sometimes, <laughs> like a cartoon character. Big eyes, fluffy tails, kind of animal you just want to pick up and bring home. And these foxes are endemic to the Channel Islands, meaning they are found here and nowhere else in the world. But about 20 years ago, people on these islands started noticing fewer and fewer foxes on the landscape. Their numbers were crashing dramatically. On Santa Cruz Island, they dropped to around 100 animals. People started sounding the alarm and saying, where are the foxes? Something's happening. Nobody knew what was happening, but we just knew that they were suddenly vanished. It was an ecological whodunit that needed to be solved before the foxes disappeared forever. The clock was ticking. What scientists discovered was a cascade of curiously connected events involving toxic waste, feral pigs, and a couple of New Zealanders jumping out of a helicopter, all to save a little island fox. From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild. I'm off the boat and on Santa Cruz Island, the largest of California's Channel Islands. My producer Matt and I are bouncing around in the back of an old Toyota pickup truck. We're making our way through a small dried up river bottom. It's dusty with steep rocky hills on either side of us. I mean, this definitely feels like the opening scene of Jurassic Park. <laughs> I wish I knew the theme tune, Matt. What is it? The Jurassic Park theme tune. Da, 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 how do you know that? <laughs> it's Jurassic Park. How do you not know? Oh, <laughs> I, need a, I need a top up of Jurassic Park. <laughs> We're here with the Nature Conservancy. TNC is a private conservation organization that owns about two thirds of Santa Cruz Island. The other third of the island is managed by the National Park Service. It's about 96 square miles, and the sole purpose of this gem of an island is to be a refuge for wildlife. No one lives here full time, but the Channel Islands are home to over 2,000 species of animals and plants. 145 of them are found nowhere else on Earth. Even crazier is the fact that we're just 60 miles from LA and a 13 million person metropolis. At the heart of island life is the island fox. Eurocyon littoralis, pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. And each of six islands has their own version of it, six subspecies. 
The foxes shared these islands with the Chumash indigenous people for thousands of years, and Santa Cruz Island is still like stepping back in time. Rolling grassy hills, pristine beaches, mountains and canyons. It's been described as Southern California 100 years ago. But more recently, it's become a special living laboratory, a place to understand evolution, ecology, and how island wildlife works. As we pull up into the Central Valley, it doesn't take long to see my first tiny predator. Oh, there's a fox. There's a fox. Oh, he's looking right at us. Oh, yeah, right in the grasses at the edge of the road. He or she stopped dead in their tracks, didn't they? Yeah, checking us out. Fox number one. I like it. (laughs) So you can kind of see how they blend into the landscape. This is Lara Brenner. She's an island biologist with the Nature Conservancy. They look like they're babies. A lot of people see them, an adult one, and, and say, oh, that's a baby. But that's a, that's, they're, they're fully grown. They have big heads, um, big eyes. Um, they're a great poster child for conservation because you can't not love them when you see them. <laughs> they're so cute. I watch the fox through my binoculars for a bit. It's really alert pointed ears, a nose to the ground, and on a mission looking for its next meal. It's got this thick coat, grey and russet coloured. The foxes weren't always this easy to spot, though. When I first arrived in the early 90s, I would see them fairly commonly. This is Dr John Randall. He's a lead scientist with the Nature Conservancy. And then towards the late 90s, they were harder and harder to see. And so there was, I think, an alarm effectively set up by what? What can be happening that we're simply not seeing them? And so it was just regular people, you know, pointing out to biologists, you know, something seems to be wrong. I'm not seeing foxes like I used to. And then that sort of spurred on a deeper investigation. But it wasn't clear for a long time what had caused either of the declines. So biologists started to pay attention. And sure enough, the fox numbers were collapsing. Without even knowing what the cause was, biologists realized something had to be done fast to save the fox. And so because there wasn't really time to do a a study to find out what happened, what was happening, the decision was made to bring the foxes into captive breeding. In 2004, the foxes were added to the endangered species list and the Nature Conservancy, along with the National Park Service, started breeding them in captivity in special pens. We're at those old pens now. They're not used anymore, so it's like stepping back into a bit of island fox history. So these are, John, these are the, uh, well, you tell me. So these are, these are, these are pens that were used for a captive breeding program. And gosh, we we have about 10 enclosures, essentially kind of a chain link, pretty, you know, Spartan. They do have, um, you you should still see that there are kind of um, areas where the foxes can perch up above the ground. Opening the gate and stepping on in here, let's have a look. This is what it would have felt like for a fox. Yeah, not much head head height for someone my size. Each pen, or enclosure, is about 30 feet by 40 feet. And back then, in the early 2000s, each would have been a temporary home to a pair of foxes, put together in the hope that they would breed, a Hail Mary attempt to save these foxes. There were a lot of unknowns, and it wasn't assured that we could succeed. But it worked. The foxes found love, had pups, They were radio collared and released onto an island paradise. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Wild. (laughs) No, (laughs) because that's when the story really started to get interesting. They tracked the newly released radio collared foxes. The hope was that they'd thrive and perhaps answer some questions along the way about why they had been mysteriously disappearing. And nearly half of them were dead within a short space of time, a couple of months maybe, and they were able to track several of them to eagle nests or to sites of obvious eagle kill. Eagles. Golden eagles were killing the foxes. 
and quickly became the prime suspect. And so they were able to figure out, okay, it's golden eagles because there are certain telltale signs like that their hind legs would be broken because the golden eagles basically pounce on them from a high altitude and break their hind legs. Um, they also found evidence of fox collars inside of golden eagle nests. The mystery was starting to unravel, but something didn't quite add up. You see, golden eagles are not native to the Channel Islands. Bald eagles were the dominant bird of prey here. Eagles are very territorial, so historically the bald eagles had always kept the golden eagles from setting up shop on the island. Until about the Second World War. It begins with the war-born development of DDT, this diabolical weapon of modern science saved millions of humans, but killed billions of insects. Man, with this newly discovered force, has at long last gained the upper hand in our age-old struggle. This now famous diabolical weapon was a little bit too diabolical. DDT killed more than just unwanted mosquitoes. It poisoned humans and caused untold damage to wildlife. And on top of all that, the companies producing DDT in Southern California were illegally dumping their waste into the ocean. They were taking barrels of DDT out into the channel and then puncturing them so they would sink and then dropping them 3,000 feet into the ocean. And so there's probably hundreds of thousands of barrels still out there. And in the ocean, the DDT moved on up the food chain through the fish and right into the bellies of the Channel Islands fish-eating bald eagles. This spelled disaster for the bald eagle population. When the DDT um, started to pollute the ocean, the bald eagles were no longer able to breed because their eggshells were so thin that they would basically crush them when they tried to sit on them. DDT chemicals in their system were weakening the bald eagle eggs to the point where the chicks couldn't survive. And so they vanished from this island and from much of the continent. America's iconic bird, practically wiped out by a chemical that was designed to kill mosquitoes. On the islands, with the bald eagles gone, there was now an empty niche to be filled. Nature abhors a vacuum, and without any competition to scare them off, golden eagles moved in and began their new lives on the Channel Islands. And there is one key difference between golden eagles and bald eagles. Golden eagles don't eat fish. They like land-based meat. And Santa Cruz Island was full of it. Enter the next suspect in the fox's demise, the feral pig. Before the Nature Conservancy owned this land, it was used for ranching. In the 1850s, settlers brought all kinds of animals to the island, cattle, sheep, and pigs for hunting. They were thinking we can make this kind of a hunter's paradise and have, you know, whatever wild game from South Africa and Canada oh, and yeah. everything. And why wouldn't they places, love it here? Yeah. yeah. By the 1980s, the days of ranching and hunting on the island were over. But the pigs, they were still here. Thousands of them. So the golden eagles, um, they're big enough to carry off a young pig, um, basically. And so they had a, a smorgasbord of food available to them. <laughs> Um, so the island was able to support lots of golden eagles who were mainly feeding on the pigs. Even though the eagles were here for the pork, they quickly figured out the island had other enticing items on the menu. Four-pound foxes. In ecology, it's called the apparent competition hypothesis. In this case, the golden eagles were mostly eating the pigs, but the foxes were victims of circumstance and they were now golden eagle targets too. They'd become subsidiary prey. So they're feeding a lot on pigs, but not reducing their population. They're feeding some on foxes, but it's enough that it's really, really drastically reducing the fox population. Death from above. Foxes hadn't evolved to be wary of predators. On this island, they had always been the top apex predator. And they especially hadn't learned to fear the skies, because the original resident, the native bald eagles, had never been a threat to the foxes. They were too busy fishing. The thing that people always say is that they had no reason to look up. Um, you know, they had no sense that there could be danger coming from the sky, or really from anywhere. Um, so they were very easy prey. So the DDT pollution killed off the bald eagles, which allowed the golden eagles to move in. 
The Golden Eagles found a great food source with the feral pigs, but were able to pick off enough foxes as a secondary meal to completely destroy the fox population. You know, in retrospect, it kind of maybe seems too simple. Like, of course, you know, we can look back and see how this trophic cascade happened, but at the time, it was a complete mystery. So now that the mystery of the missing foxes was solved, the question became how to reset the ecosystem and bring them back. Ooh, that's strong. Suddenly very strong. I'm out with Lara Brenner again, this time tracking a fox. She has a telemetry antenna over her head, listening to the beeps of a nearby female fox with a radio collar. It's inconsistent. You think she's over the hill or this side? I don't know. Oh, no. (laughs) She may be over the hill, actually. She may have gone up over. Monitoring the foxes like this is really important. The last thing biologists want is to be caught off guard again like they were with the pigs and the golden eagles. The foxes had dropped to just 100 or so on Santa Cruz Island 20 years ago. Not something to be repeated. Bringing the foxes back from the brink involved some bizarre and intensive efforts to reconstruct the ecological puzzle one piece at a time. First, the golden eagles. It was decided that if the foxes were to have any chance of recovering, the golden eagles would have to be removed. Gently, they weren't to be harmed. It wasn't easy. A few things were tried. Robotic foxes as lures, artificial eagle eggs designed to inject the tranquilizer, and big hoop-like nets that were placed around the island with bait in the middle. And it was almost like like a big um, tr- a circle um, with metal, it's hard to explain. <laughs> I know what you mean. What is it like? It's like a... It's like a clamshell. It's like a taco. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Or, um, yeah, but like... Or a clamshell, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so they they pounce on the bait, the two halves of the clamshell snap shut over them, and there's a net, and they get tangled in the net, and then the biologist would run out, untangle it, put it in a carrier, take it over to the mainland on, on a boat or on a plane, and uh, release them in Northern California. It took seven years to catch every golden eagle. At the same time the golden eagles were being removed from the island and relocated to Northern California, the bald eagle team was focused on bringing the bald eagles back to the island. They were rearing bald eagles in captivity, um, chicks to a certain size. They they would bring them to the island, put them on tall tall towers that they called hack towers that were basically to uh, uh, acclimate them to the environment and then releasing them and hoping that they stuck around um, to breed on Santa Cruz Island. It started out with two breeding pairs and the first wild-born bald eagle in 50 years here. And slowly it grew to seven breeding pairs and gradually the bald eagles returned to the islands. And so far so good. Territorial bald eagles have kept the golden eagles away. But removing the golden eagles wasn't the only problem that needed fixing. Something had to be done about the pigs. We head up a steep mountain road, up to the top of the ridgeline. Lara and John want to show me an important spot, the other part of the Fox's recovery program. We're right on top of this ridge here, John, what, and, and <laughs> looking at a very long fence. What's the story? This fence was erected uh, for the pig removal. Uh, the fences were erected very carefully. They still look beautifully intact, um, 15 plus years after the, the pig removal effort was undertaken. The fence was a key part of the pig removal strategy. They weren't as lucky as the relocated eagles. For this to work, the pigs would have to be hunted off the island. So the Nature Conservancy and the National Park Service worked together and fenced the island into sections. The idea was that if they had to rid the entire island at once of pigs, that would be almost impossible because you'd be kind of, you know, uh, Benny Hill chasing them all up and down the island. Um, You'd go over there, they'd run back over here. So the idea was that they would fence the island into more manageable chunks that way. And besides, Benny Hill wasn't available. So fencing like this would make hunting easier and help them know when the very last pig was removed. 
and to the experts, a precision wildlife SWAT team from New Zealand and their helicopter. They were hired to rid the islands of the pigs, starting at the highest point of each fence section every morning and hunting down the hillside, repeating that until they were confident all the pigs had been removed from that section. They did this across the entire 22 by 6 mile island. But the planners were careful to make sure that the fence didn't cause any problems for the foxes. If you notice the size of the openings, they're plenty large enough for a fox to move through, but not large enough for a pig to move through. So it was also done with that very much in mind. It's always a bit controversial when one species is lethally removed to help another. But the Nature Conservancy knew the science was clear. To bring the foxes back, the pigs needed to go. The pig removal took every day for a year and a half. So this was a real vital element in that removal effort and in that recovery effort of the island fox. These recovery efforts haven't just helped the foxes. They've actually changed the look and plant life of the island. John made his first trip out to the island in 1991, before any pigs were removed. And everywhere I went on the island, there was digging. The pigs had been uh, digging and it looked like it had been rototilled in many areas. There was pig poop in every study site that I visited. John wasn't able to make it back out to the island until a few years after the pigs were all gone, but he didn't expect to see what he saw on that first trip back. It didn't enter my mind that it would look so different, but when I got out on the ground and saw some of the the vegetation sites I'd been to before, time and time again, it was just this thrill. There was no pig poop anywhere. The digging had already begun to heal. It was really amazing to be able to experience that change. In the, in the span of my visits. It was really great. While all of this was happening, the captive breeding program was churning out new foxes all the time. And without the threat of the pigs or the golden eagles, the fox population started to skyrocket. In the 1990s, the population de- density of the foxes was around 2,500 individuals. Um, in a few years, it dropped down to about 100 individuals. And then over the course of 10 years, it's now recovered back to full carrying capacity. So that's, a, that's an incredibly rapid rate of recovery. And how many now? Uh, most recent estimate was 2,339. And that's not really as, as precise as it sounds, but that, that's the number <laughs> that the, the model spit out. The um, point so is it's pretty close to its original. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now we're kind of at this place where nature is more in balance. The bald eagles keep the golden eagles out. The foxes have recovered and are doing really well. Um, it's one of the, it is the fastest recovery of a mammal on the, uh, that was placed on the Endangered Species Act. Today, foxes have reached the carrying capacity for the island. That means the number of foxes that the landscape can sustain. And it's a healthy sign that this ecosystem is working again. The foxes have rebounded so well, they're actually becoming a bit of a nuisance at times for visitors. A pretty delightful nuisance. I was warned not to leave any belongings outside. Nothing. Packs, socks, sunglasses. Because a fox will either pee on them or just run off with them. They've even learned how to open the zippers of unsuspecting campers to steal their food. Someone told me a fox um, that they were feeding a fox uh, butter, a stick of butter, and the fox ate the whole thing. Um, <laughs> So they don't, they don't have like a, a lot of common sense about what they should and shouldn't eat. I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> um, There's days I could eat a stick of butter. Yeah. <laughs> the fox is a smart creature, something that probably helped their successful return. But that doesn't mean there aren't any threats. Lara and the rest of the TNC crew are ever vigilant with protecting this island and these foxes. Let's see if we can hear her, actually. Back with Lara doing the telemetry work we can still pick up a signal of that collared fox. Yep, dead ahead. Well, cool. Perfect. (laughs) The foxes may be safe from golden eagles now, but there are still threats. Once a year, they capture foxes on the island to do health checks and give them vaccines. There's constant monitoring of the population. They don't want to get caught off guard again. Lara and others that work here are most worried of virus or infection brought to the island could be the next big problem for the foxes. She tells me that's why they have these collared foxes. She calls them the sentinel foxes. So we have sentinel foxes that are purposefully not vaccinated and they are radio collared instead. So the idea being if a big batch of sentinel foxes suddenly dies, 
um, we might get a tip off early that something there may have been an introduction of a disease. It's like an early warning system. There are 40 of these sentinel foxes on the island. Biologists fly weekly radio telemetry flights in a small plane to make sure all 40 sentinel foxes are accounted for. And if they see a big spike in deaths, they know something might be happening to the fox population. The ecosystem is a, a remarkably resilient and has recovered a lot passively on its own, but uh, it's not enough. I, I think that a lot of active restoration is going to be needed uh, into the future. That active restoration, all of these amazing efforts have gotten the foxes where they are today, back on top as the apex predator of Santa Cruz Island. And Lara doesn't take her role in this elaborate fox story lightly. When I look at this captive breeding pen and I look at the photos and I hear the oral history of, of how all these different groups came together in an emergency situation and, and scooped the species back from the brink of extinction, is that I, I just feel an enormous responsibility to make sure that their efforts weren't wasted so that we continue to keep an eye on the ecosystem, and not just foxes, but all the other endemic species of plants and animals that are on this island. Sometimes wildlife conservation can seem overwhelming and totally perplexing because at its root is the science of ecology, which is a complex thing, not to mention add in politics and competing interests. It's kind of a proof that we can do things that seem impossible and, uh, and it's just a, a lesson to don't give up. <laughs> Even if it seems like it's impossible now, you know, keep approaching it. The story of the island foxes shows that if we follow the science, we can save species on the edge, especially in places like this. And we can do big things here for conservation. It's all this entire island is is for is managed for conservation. And being an island out at sea, it's easier just to focus on the science, to figure out the building blocks. And I think that it's a lesson for, you know, globally around the world that if we can do it here, it's kind of like a small, you know, piece of it. It's, it's, a, it's a small controlled laboratory that they can then kind of try out in other parts of the world. On the boat heading back to the mainland, I look back at Santa Cruz Island as it disappears in the fog behind me. A 96 square mile laboratory where an ecological house of cards began to collapse, but was figured out in time and mended. All it took was a sweet little fox to set it all in motion. We have some great photos of the island foxes on Instagram at The Wild Pod, and you can find me at Chris Morgan Wildlife. The Wild is inspired not just by nature, but by people who work in it, love it, protect it. The Wild is a joint production of myself and KUOW Public Radio. One way to support this vital work is through my wildlife organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, on Patreon. There's a link in the show notes. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Mark and Rebecca Wilkins, Bob Yellowlees, and Paul Lister. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producer is Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. Our production team includes David Brown, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Kara McDermott, Theo Popescu, Darcy Riggin Schmidt, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm your host, Chris Morgan. Thanks so much for listening. And if you enjoy The Wild, please do ask your friends to follow our podcast and maybe even give us a review. Thank you, and take good care. Mm-hmm.